still some of the best imagery I think we've ever had because it shows how seals feel. You know, it lets you feel like you're a seal. You know, when you put these cameras on the, on the uh, animals, not only are you diving into the ocean and getting a sense of what they see, sometimes first ever vision, but you actually realize how different these creatures are. You know, their three dimensionality, their ability to hold their breath, to go in the dark under crushing pressures. So for me, I became a convert to the uh, power of the image and the power of geographic, partly because of the Critter Camp um, footage, you know, this, this notion that people could be awakened to the uh, wonders of the natural world. So what I'm hoping to convince those of you who don't work with us yet, um, I want to convince you of two things. First of all, we can be a good partner to folks like Google Ocean. We can also be a, a megaphone for the conservation community. And there are a few places, uh, institutions on the planet that reach 400 million people a month. And what we're looking for, what I'm looking for, are the next great stories, the next great partners, the next great images, um, and uh, of course the next new modes of getting that information to the broadest audience as possible. So um, for those of you who haven't um, yet worked with us, um, I, this is an open invitation to corner me and uh, give me your contact info and tell me your story. So in the next uh, 30 minutes or so, I want to talk to you about how we tell ocean stories and geographic, some of the partnerships we've had with Google, as well as the um, new tools that we're employing to make the ocean sing um, and sparkle for, uh, for the audience around the world. Um, and I'd like to be able to advance this. Um, sorry? No, because they're working off of my, uh, my laptop. So next slide, please. Um, as, as Jennifer mentioned, we, uh, we actually started uh, this ambition with uh, Google Earth and Google Ocean, um, stimulated by Sylvia and uh, her, her, her uh, lively notion of Google uh, Earth and Google Dirt. Actually, somebody took issue with that to me uh, yesterday. He was an <coughs> earthworm specialist. So, yeah. And he told me that dirt is the rock structure, soil is the living fabric, and so you're degrading the terrestrial environment with a geo geological term of dirt. But regardless, we aren't giving enough attention to the earth, and, uh, or to the ocean rather, and um, so it's a, it was appropriate to call, uh, call Google's attention. I'm so uh, grateful that we made that step. And I got to take part with Sylvia in the first planning session for Google Ocean. And, and Mark Bauman, my colleague, was, has been very helpful with Jennifer and others to carry it forward substantially at Geographic. Next slide. Can I do it? No? Great, thank you. So um, Geographic, as you know, is, has you know 30 or so different ways to tell a story. One of, the, one of the ones that you may not be aware of, besides the magazines and the channel and so on, is um, we do special publications. We did one on the ocean here. You see one of my favorite critters. This is a leopard seal. Um, you know, a rapacious seal-eating, penguin-eating critter of Antarctica, which um, a friend of mine who dives in Antarctica says, when you enter the water in Antarctica, you enter the, the east food web. <laughs> and uh, these guys are part of that um, sharp end that uh, you have to be careful about. But anyway, uh, beautiful publications. You know, the reach of geographic in the oceans is substantial. Uh, but you know the um, the cool stuff that we're doing is actually on uh, you know with uh, Google Earth and we have the quiz that um, that Jennifer mentioned. Um, we have a um, special enterprise which you all have to look at if you haven't already called the Ocean Health Index. It's a partnership with uh, Conservation International and New England Aquarium, and it actually is giving a one-stop shop for how is the ocean doing, and you can compare the uh, quality of ocean conservation, of ocean health, with a numerical um, figure. In the case of all the uh, countries in the world, the average value that's been compiled is 60. Ben Halperin and others have worked on this very um, carefully over a couple of years, just announced on, in Nature. And there are 10 different metrics that the ocean is measured on. Each country by country, you can check and see how's the ocean doing. And the best part is you can dive into each of these um, features of the ocean for any country and look at how they're doing 
Um, in these categories, you can learn and you can become educated at multiple layers. So this site, I think, is the go-to site for seeing how people can be engaged in a broad audience on ocean issues, and I encourage you all to take a look at it. Um, another uh, event that's happening in uh, National Geographic, and it's just airing on September 30th, is uh, Alien Deep with Bob Ballard. It's a new series that we've invested a fair amount of resources in, including grants from my programs, to go and look at the deep ocean with Bob and his, um, uh, his uh, ship. And it's our effort on the high end uh, to, to reach large audiences through our channel with the ocean. So tune into that if you can. Um, and uh, you have to know as well that National Geographic helps people get physically to these places around the world. And our partner in that is Lindblad Expeditions. If you've never traveled with Lindblad and you have a desire to do shipboard um, exploration and learning, it is the, the organization to go to. It's not just because they're our partner. Uh, Sven Lindblad and his team are absolutely incredible. One of the things that they do that helps people know about the ocean, besides taking people there and giving wonderful lectures, is you can actually take photographs and videos they do with their onboard cameraman, and they can upload it to, um, to Google Earth so that we have travelers who are basically our outposts for mo um, monitoring the ocean. And they can take pictures. Now, I have a friend who studies blue whales in the Gulf of California, and photographs taken from the ship now are going into our um, uh, scientific databases with the help of uh, 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 Lindblad and so, and with also the connections to uh, uh, Google Earth. So that's yet another way that we interface with, um, with Google Earth. Of course, imageries and exploration are our stock in trade. And as I said, I've been working with CritterCam for a couple of decades now. The, um, uh, the folks who really have done the work on the CritterCam team include Greg Marshall in the upper left, who is the inventor of CritterCam, a good friend of mine, and Kyler Abernathy, who goes out. They've done over 50 different species of CritterCam deployments now. And they are basically, as I said before, opening up the world to the um, uh, part of the marine experience from the, from the critters who actually live there. One of the key uh, cool things we've done with Google recently is our Google Hangouts, of course. And uh, we actually had a, a hangout in the lab where these guys do their work. And if you have a chance, you can actually go online and, and see the archived uh, imagery of their um, sh show and tell, which was live. Everybody got to play uh, with the engineers and see you know, who, who dreams up these things. You know, they're really great people. Um, and we're doing more and more of this Google, um, Google Plus interface with, uh, with um, our friends at Google, including our recent Explorer Symposium. We have one every year. It's a week long. It's probably the coolest thing that happens on the planet when it comes to exploration, because all of our 100, 150 experts come for a week to, to hang out together. And we let some people hang out with, with our experts, including Elizabeth Lindsay here, and a couple of others, Katie Croft, who, uh, who works in uh, marine archaeology. Um, Elizabeth is actually uh, very involved in the, um, the anthropological side of oceans. And she looks at uh, voyagers in particular. But she was online just chatting with people about her view on the human interface with the oceans. But that was just one of many hangouts. We um, got to hang out with Sylvia and her friends in Aquarius recently. And as you may know, there's a real strong ener energy around trying to keep Aquarius alive. Sylvia has done some fundraising on that. Pulling people into these, these hangouts is a way to get it personal with them about the people who care and direct them to the next steps so that they can actually support Aquarius if they're so moved. So we're doing more and more of these hangouts. I think it's one of the more exciting ways that we can use technology to get people uh, to be able to experience the exploration that I get to live every day at National Geographic. The, um, one of our um, proponents in, in uh, National Geographic of pristine seas is Enrique Saw. And he's been going to locations around the world that are um, reflect habitat in their best um, uh, status so that people can actually have a place to park their thoughts when they think, where do we want the ocean to be with respect to quality and, and health? So he recently went to Sali Gomez and uh, did an expedition there, which we, he was able to, then, then to um, allow us to follow 
on uh, Google Earth, and you can go and the, the images and the um, experiences are archived. They started out in um, Easter Island, and then they went, uh, it's about an hour sail to Sali Gomez, which are some rocks that few people visit. I actually got to go there once and land and do a bird count. It was absolutely phenomenal. But they went into the water, and they brought people with them. Uh, and you can go and, and relive that experience. It turns out that this expedition raised the bar of attention for Chile and has been instrumental in moving protected area um, attention to this pristine locale, all from the engine of you know Google Earth and our effort to get uh, Enrique and his associates out to uh, this special location. The, um, as Jennifer mentioned, we've also done mapping with uh, Google Earth in this uh, this uh, portrayal you see here is of uh, chlorophyll levels, which uh, in our National Geographic maps are you know, very, very um, powerful, wonderful, but to be able to lay them onto the ocean and to have them basically reflect some of the key things about ocean health, including where is the upwelling occurring. You see along the Peruvian coast here um, the, uh, the hot spots where upwelling occurs seasonally, and you also see a, or a reddish tongue of water here when you follow the El Nino from, uh, um, uh, er, uh, from the uh, air, you can actually see the warm tongue reflected in terms of chlor chlorophyll. So there is a um, uh, you know, wonderful dimension that can happen between you know, Google and Earth and uh, National Geographic when it comes to mapping. I have to point out that there are a bunch of yellow rectangles on here. I just happen to carry that on my Google Earth because that's all the grants that we've given in this region. We actually have a history of 10,000 grants around the world, and I spent four years of intern power mapping all of those grants on a, KM, a KML file that um, is now projectable on Google Earth. You can click on any of these rectangles if you care to go to our website. And this one here, if you click it, is uh, two of my grants I got from National Geographic to work on the Juan Fernandez Islands. And here, uh, farther down and to the left is the, uh, sorry about that, um, farther down and to the left is the, uh, hold on a second. Um, is the uh, uh, Easter Island, where we've given a number of grants as well. So uh, anyway, uh, just to explain those rectangles, uh, the world is um, covered or littered, I'd, I'd like to think enriched, by the yellow rectangles that are our, our grant history. Um, you can also find some, if you turned off my grant layer, you'd find some really standout yellow rectangles, which are um, magazine articles. So we've actually loaded up our, um, our media onto Google Earth as well, and so you can go and virtually experience in a geo-referenced way. In this case, uh, you know, a story about um, a tuna, but, uh, you know, it could be anything around the world that has to do with, uh, with the, the uh, global ocean um, story. So we use the uh, interface a lot when it comes to getting people to uh, travel the uh, globe with National Geographic um, history and, and uh, enlightenment. Now, the tools that we use and the ones we can do an even better job of loading up on Google Earth are, um, are wonderful. Uh, I want to show you a couple of them. Our remote imaging team is absolutely creative. And in this case, they've um, on small ships now, you can go to the bottom of the ocean using these things called drop cams and sun spheres. And so the, the cameras are um, buoyant and they can be uh, released from the bottom once they've gone down to image uh, extreme depths. And they're in housed in, in, uh, in inch, inch and a half thick glass spheres, so they're crush proof. And they also carry LEDs that are brighter than anything that's been created for ocean exploration. <clears throat> the, um, the, this is an example of a, um, a trip we had down into the, I'm um, oh, sorry, I need to go back one, I'm sorry. Can you help me go back one? And I don't know if I can click on that, so. It didn't seem to play. So can you click on that space bar? Or here we go. Okay, so this is a sun sphere being launched. And uh, if, you, if you go down to the bottom of the, this actually predated um, Jim Cameron by quite a, more than half a year. We went down to uh, um, almost full depth in the Marianas Trench and we were able to image for the first time uh, the Xeno file fours, um, this is 36,000 feet deep with a drop cam off from a small boat. And we are also able to, besides these highlighted xenophile fours, we are able to uh, see uh, 
uh, species of jellyfish that had never been observed at depth. Um, this was, you know, a very inexpensive way to go down without risking life and limb, and it's one that we're using, um, you know, around the planet now to, uh, sorry, we're going to have to advance one, and if I click, it's going to just play again, so could you advance one slide, thanks. Uh, so, you know, we're using this around, in fact, Mike Shepard is now in the Tonga Trench, as I'm speaking, deploying drop cams. So this is being used effectively around the world. And the images that come back can be geo-referenced and people can take that exploration with us. <clears throat> Rather painless, um, just have to get the people and the equipment and a small boat in there and you're there. The other uh, the cool thing that we do, which I've already talked about, but you have to see this, um, is we get to go to, um, uh, you know, exotic places and study species like white sharks. how they behave 
um, you know, without humans nearby observing them. So it's been a great tool for Bill Gilley, who's a leading scientist on Humboldt Squid. Next slide. The, um, we have other tools besides uh, Critter Cam, which can likewise light up the ocean, so to speak. And this is a, um, a camera system that we use to image cenotes in caves. And what it does is it takes multiple very high-res images and can stitch them together so you end up with a 360-degree view of any um, environment that can be lit. And in so doing, people can then go down into a cenote, a cave, and travel it by themselves across a 360-degree stitched environment. Next slide. So this is a new tool that we've had. And we also use LiDAR imaging under, under the um, water. In this case, in a cenote, we um, found a skull, which we are still getting uh, data on. But it may um, rival the oldest um, records of human occupation in North America. This is in the Yucatan. The, the folks who are the archaeologists here wanted to image the skull but to not take it out of the aquatic environment. So what they did is they took a LiDAR um, camera down and a platform and they very carefully, without stirring up sediment or dropping the skull, um, they, uh, their challenge was to pick it up, take it to the platform, and then ultimately to use this imaging system to create a three-dimensional